Welcome to this uh, Labour Business webinar on the impact of coronavirus on the businesses of the UK. Thank you to all of our members who have joined this call. Uh, there are 41 of us uh, here today um, and 15 of those have volunteered to share their experiences from the business front line. And a big, big thank you to Lucy Powell for making time uh, to be with us. Quite clearly, coronavirus is an economic crisis as well as a health crisis. Uh, and that's why since early March, we've been almost totally focused uh, on the economic crisis, supporting Keir Starmer and the new Labour leadership team as they try to provide a constructive, but yes, critical assessment of uh, the efforts of the government to mitigate the impact of coronavirus on businesses. So we've engaged directly with Keir, with his shadow chancellor, Annalise Dodds, and with Ed Miliband, his uh, shadow uh, Bay's secretary, providing data from uh, our all member survey at the end of March, sharing case histories from our members uh, on the business front line. And this webinar is really the next step in that process of supporting the new leadership. The idea is to bring our members into even closer communication with the shadow front bench. Funny how the lockdown now seems to make that easier, um, <laughs> but I wouldn't wish for it for that reason. Uh, but uh, also providing Keir and his team with uh, the ammunition they need uh, to identify the shortcomings in the government's response, both in terms of policy and delivery, and to get those shortcomings fixed. That's why we're so delighted to be here with Lucy, uh, who has the responsibility for taking that fight to the floor, the virtual floor of the House of Commons. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, Lucy is the Labour MP for Manchester Central. Uh, she was elected in 2012. And in April of this year, she was appointed by Keir to Ed Miliband's Shadow Bay's team as Shadow Minister for Business and Consumers. Not just small business, but all business. So I turn now to uh, Lucy. Welcome again, Lucy. Uh, can I ask you to give us a sense of your perspectives in the new job, your, your priorities, and what you'd like to get out of this webinar? Hi, thanks so much, Hamish, and thank you everyone for uh, joining this call and for those of you who've contacted me already and been tweeting me and, and various things like that. So um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm the MP for Manchester Central and as such, although I've got one of the poorest constituencies in the country, uh, it's a very big constituency, it also contains um, probably the main kind of economic powerhouse of the of, of the north really in the, the central part of, of Manchester but certainly in Greater Manchester and our region so uh, I represent uh, many thousands of businesses uh, of all different types from sort of micro startup businesses we've got quite a big digital tech sector here in Manchester um, right through to hospitality retail and so on as well um, Liz, Liz might be pleased to know that I think um, I think I read about a year ago that of all the constituencies in the country, uh, I have the most pubs uh, of any MP. So I came into this role already, it was a few weeks after coronavirus had begun. And so I already had quite a good feel myself from my own caseload and from all those that have been in touch with me and all the business networks that I have in Manchester and some of the, the key issues that you, you were all facing. So I've tried to um, develop that understanding through, um, these sorts of conversations with business communities uh, and business organisations and to uh, work through Ed with the rest of the Shadow Cabinet and Care um, and the leadership team to, so that we can be a bit further ahead of the curve than I think possibly are at the moment in just in terms of being further on with, with demanding more business support. Um, I think you've been sent round all the different bits of my brief that are included but I guess they're sort of irrelevant for right now because my job right now is, is the same as your job right now, which is to, to try and ensure that the level of business support is up to the task 
of the crisis that that we're now in economically and what that's going to mean for the long term so i mean i'm really in listening mode today so this is all about me hearing from you but just as a quick sort of summary of the things that i've been pushing on from sort of the beginning uh, obviously on the kind of business support area um, and Ed Miliband as you'll know from the conversation with him you know, has really been pushing on some of the inadequacies of the C-bill scheme you know uh, particularly calling on government to make that 100% guaranteed uh, that's uh, you know there's been some welcome news on that uh, by the government earlier this week as you'll all know with the bounce back loans and hopefully that will now unlock a bit more cash getting to the front line than has hitherto been the case because of course Although that scheme on paper looks like an incredibly ambitious one, 330 billion pounds worth of, um, of, of loans available, to date only about two and a half billion of that money has actually gone out the door. So the government, the government will talk about we're the most ambitious in the, in the world, we've got the most generous in the world, but it's only generous if it actually ends up in, uh, in the hands of business and not sort of stuck in a, a bank on, on a piece of paper somewhere. Um, so hopefully that will help with part of that, but there are still some real holes in that C-bill scheme as it exists, uh, e even with that bounce back loan. So it'd be interesting to hear your sort of take on that. Um, as, as Liz and, and others will know, I, I've been sort of particularly vocal about, um, and I want us to sort of take a firmer position as the Labour Party on this as well, about uh, you know the, the inadequacies of the grant scheme as well there are too many businesses missing out on that grant scheme again on paper it looks very generous but the vast majority of, of small businesses who that grant scheme is there to support um can't can't get it don't qualify for it and why is that important well because for a lot of businesses a loan just isn't an option is it you all know that either because um you wouldn't get a loan you don't want a loan and I think particularly increasingly because the uncertainty around um, the coronavirus lockdown, how that will be eased, what that will mean for, for trade and business getting back to any kind of normality means that you can't get a loan today for £20,000 if that's not even going to last you through till um, June or July when your business will still be closed. So there's too much uncertainty around. So I think the cash grant scheme um, is that important safety net that sits under the loan scheme. But there, there were far too many um, bits of, of uh, far too many huge amounts of sort of business in different sectors missing out on that. And we, we could have a chat with you about that. Um, Ed and I are working on um, some sectoral responses because, of course, there are some sectors that are particularly hard hit: hospitality, retail, travel industry, um, some key manufacturing, key infrastructure like. Seal, which um, is also my responsibility uh, when we talk to the car manufacturers and so on as well. Um, happy to have a chat about about that. Um, and then I think the sort of two bigger thing, bigger picture things that we're trying to shape a bit is trying to get more certainty in this very uncertain time. Um, so even if we don't know when are things are going to happen, uh, that's why Keir has been so strong in calling for you know the exit strategy to be more openly discussed, more published, so that even if we don't know the exact timing, because of course we won't, but at least some idea about what that would mean for certain businesses, certain sectors and so on, how and when might some of that um, trade be able to, to, to resume, because then, then that would help with the kind of conversations that people are having at the moment. And then a, a, a more future looking part of that is thinking about the type of economy that, we, uh, that, that we're gonna have coming out of this crisis and how labor um, might be able to start setting a, a clearer narrative of, about that. So some of the obvious aspects of that would be, um, you know, more conditionality with some of the big bailouts in some of the sectors. Um, so around dividends or offshoring and that kind of thing. Um, uh, but also the kind of skills levels, uh, the wage levels, and those sorts of things com coming out as well. Um, is, does that sound okay? Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 Lucy, that was perfect. We did that's all fine. Hear you very that's clearly. what I wanted to say. Yeah, that's great. Okay, that's that's very helpful to get the context. And just let me say, for Labour Business, we've all been watching very closely what you've been up to. We really applaud that you've hit the ground running and and starting to pick apart what the government's doing, and and not to be opposition for opposition's sake, as Keir said, that's not what it's about, but to to be a critical uh, uh, assessor and identify gaps and shortcomings with a view to getting them filled and fixed. 
And that's sort of what this webinar is about. Hopefully we'll give you some uh, evidence uh, to carry on that, that battle. So we've got three uh, segments of this discussion. The first one is the assessment of the, the government's financial uh, package. Uh, we've got 10 minutes for each of these three segments. So I'm gonna have to ask you to, to move your discussion along uh, with reasonable speed. And I'm very pleased to introduce, uh, to lead our first segment, uh, Liz Hind, who, as you can see, uh, possibly from the photograph, is sitting in an empty pub of which she is the, the pub landlady. She's also, importantly, the chair of our Women in Business Policy Group, which we uh, set up last year. So, Liz, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Hamish. And can I start by saying thank you to Lucy for giving us the time today. Congratulations, of course, on your appointment. And I'm sure that you know, Labour Business is, is here to support you and, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Um, so the first segment that we're talking about is some of the gaps in, in schemes that are supposed to support businesses like mine. Um, and I think as we all are aware that you know, when we're talking about gaps in these schemes, what we're talking about for each gap is thousands of people that have been left with absolutely no support whatsoever. Um, here I am sat in my, my pub and I don't know what's going to happen beyond the end of June. Um, the only support, financial support that I've got coming in is the furlough scheme, which is, is due to run out at the end of June and then I've got no money coming in at all. So can I kick off this session just by asking a question to you and, you know, we're very pleased that you're listening to us. What sort of indication do you have from government that they're listening to you and listening to the rest of the business community? And is there hope that we will get some of these gaps filled? Well, look, I think, I mean, I think certainly for hospitality and retail, um, I, I just can't see how they can avoid that um, for, for much longer, especially once, once we start getting more indications about the next phase of the lockdown. Um, I thought, you know, what's quite interesting is a lot of Conservative MPs have been sort of messaging me and tweeting me. I asked a PMQ about the hospitality sector uh, last week and uh, I've done a few sort of interviews and things like that. And um, there's a lot of Tory MPs who agree with me as well. So they, they see themselves as the party of the pub landlord and, you know, a small business. Um, and so I think the more we can make a bit more running on this, I think the more that pressure will come, especially as it becomes clearer that certain um, sectors and certain businesses will have to stay closed for a lot longer than they um, than they, they thought at the beginning. So there's going to need to be like a second wave of support. Um, Matt Han you might have seen that Matt Hancock got asked about um, the Raise the Bar campaign at one of the press conferences earlier this week and he was very open to it actually. Um, uh, he didn't, he, he was, uh, he said he was going to go away and speak to the Chancellor and that kind of thing. So I mean, you know, it's hard, it's hard to tell. We've just got to keep campaigning, haven't we, and keep pushing. Um, but if, if they don't do more for some sectors, um, there's going to be no sectors really left. I think. So I mentioned at the beginning there about the furlough scheme, and that's kind of a holding until the end of June for us. Um, I had a question sent to me from someone who is a bit camera shy, Chris, one of our members who was asking that the government furlough scheme is incentivizing economic inactivity, which of course in manufacturing is, is useless because what they'd like to see is some short time working because they need to have people short time but use their expertise. So do you think that it's possible that we will see a change to that furlough scheme and more flexibility? Well, there's, again, there's, there's growing pressure there. CBI, other business organisations, ourselves, um, and more and more people asking for that, especially, again, as, as we hit the sort of phase where some businesses are reopening. Um, so you would need more flexibility in the furlough scheme to allow um, some workers to come in and get the, everything ready for that, to get preparations underway, to keep maintain client databases, um, there's, there's a number of issues around sort of machinery and insurances. I think obviously in your trade, um, stock that's going off and that kind of thing and, and needing people to come in and deal with those sorts of things. 
um, so that is being pushed. Um, that is being pushed, I know. So as, again, as, as we see the government moving on what the phasing is going to be of the easing of the lockdown, that's probably the point at which they'll make some of those some of those announcements i hope but we'll, we'll continue to push that liz so, just on on that point i think it was striking how at the webinar on monday some of you were there uh with the fsb and uh, quickbooks uh which we supported um the clear message was that the furlough scheme is too inflexible so for example a small business might have a, a key worker who, who does certain critical things to keep the business going, but if they're furloughed full time, they're not allowed to do anything. What they need is part time furlough in some cases. And so greater flexibility is, is a key uh, demand, I think. And I hope, as, as Lucy says, that the government will come back to that point. So, or, or, indeed, or indeed, what people are asking for, I think the CBI and others are asking for is that say in every 15 day period someone's allowed to actually work three days even though they're being paid for through the furlough scheme so it's yeah it, it, it's it's a range of those things again i think there's a growing tide on the tory backbenches for that as well so that's always a good pressure point so turning back to sort of the idea of grant schemes and that some businesses are going to need grants um the current scheme is based on rateable value which has obviously left quite a lot of businesses you know, not being able to claim anything at all. And actually, I'd like to bring in one of our Labour business members, Hakeem, to talk about this. I know he's got a question. Hakeem, do you want to unmute and ask your question, please? So uh, thank you uh, for, the, for uh, giving me a platform to speak and raise a point on this. So uh, a bit of background. So I run a, a media training agency um, and strategic business consultancy, where we especially help young entrepreneurs um, create multiple income streams and try and maximize the returns on those streams. Um, and businesses like ours that might sublet or use co-working spaces or a home-based, especially using you know, digital, you know, digital platforms and so on, we've not been included in the grant because they're using the business rates as the measure mm -hmm which um, we feel um, certainly just doesn't really capture or understand today's economy or help us. So um, what I was uh, wanting to do is sort of speak with uh, the rest of you and see if we could come up with a policy or some suggestions for the government on how they can um, redevelop or uh, expand that policy so, it, so it's not just based on business rates but uses a more accurate measure in today's economy that helps those of us that use digital platforms especially given that they've said that they want the uk to be you know the future of tech and digital innovation yeah well it's a, that's a really good question um, um yeah. but yeah i mean th this has been raised with me it was raised with me before i took this job because i've got a lot of digital tech in my own constituency many of whom either work from home work in serviced offices i've got the sharp project that houses about 75 sort of small digital creative businesses um, they were straight in touch with me so um, it was something I was aware of right from the beginning I mean I think and I've been pushing away at it and will continue to do so but I think yeah that would be if, if, um, if as a group you could maybe sort of think about what would be a policy solution so what gets said back is well how do you then um, sort of stop a system where you're paying out grants to a lot of dormant companies that are just sort of you know in, on paper in companies house but they don't have a premises and that kind of thing so I think probably what we need to think about there because and again lots of business organizations are raising it but the policy solution itself is less clear um, now you know may have to be some proof of um, you know by ongoing trading or something I don't know but perhaps perhaps that is something you could you could you could take away and come back to me with some with a policy suggestion on that would be really yes nice. well they released the um the bounce back loans as they call them uh yesterday well they've they've announced it and for that they're saying that the banks only need to do rudimentary checks to or so anti um, anti money laundering um and id checks now we, we've yet to see the detail of what that actually looks like and how that will work, but something like that could serve as the model 
or could be um, redeveloped uh, and repurposed for, for, from a grants perspective as well. Although it's a bit different, isn't it? If you're getting the kind of free cash as opposed to a, a loan, I think that's going to be that, that, that I'm only telling you what gets said back to us when we, when we raise these things, but I'm sure there must be a, you know, an, another way of dealing with that, but businesses and serviced offices, shared premises, startups, micro businesses, those sort of work from home some of the time, that kind of thing, are all, and there's, there's I think um, CBI estimated that there was, there was something like 200 odd thousand businesses in that sort of situation um, yeah. that were, you know, with exactly the sort of businesses that the grants were designed for. Um, but I think that's one of, of difficulty to execute more than probably uh, a principle. Yeah, well, one... just, sorry, we're, we're running oh, out yeah. of time on this segment. Um, just to bring in a suggestion that came through again from an anonymous email person, um, in that we have seen a lot of stumbling blocks getting liquidity into businesses because we're either you know, relying on the banks to facilitate that, or in the case of grants, on local authorities to do that. So the suggestion was. Um, whether you'd consider proposing that HMRC transfer funding directly to SMEs once funding or you know, loans, whether grants has been approved, and to use that mechanism instead? Um, I mean, I'm not sure at this stage whether that creating a whole other system is going to make it any quicker. Um, don't know, be guided by by others on that. Um, I mean, I think the local authority money is now getting out some have been a bit quicker than others i mean i think what the local authority scheme does is it gives us a basis for for example if the grant scheme uh, needs to be extended further both to a higher rateable value and also if um you know if further grants need to be paid out because the lockdown is continuing or um the, the period of non-trading is continuing so you've already got the mechanism there so i'm not sure necessarily reinventing that wheel i think most people have had a pretty good experience with their local authority um i mean look let's see on the bounce back i think the bounce back loan idea now hopefully should see a lot more cash going out the door more quickly hmrc have got a lot on themselves with the furlough scheme and the self-assessment um the self-employed scheme so i'm not sure they would have the capacity any more than than the than the, the banks really so i mean i think the next couple of weeks are critical for both the loans and the grants getting out the door um, and maybe that's the point to review. We're seeing a lot of speculation from people who don't run businesses about how businesses like pubs could open and have reduced capacity. Can we have some commitment to engagement with actual business owners that might know how this might work? Definitely, yeah. Definitely. Brilliant. Thank you very okay. much. Thanks very much, Liz, and thanks to those who contributed to her segment. We'll move on to segment number two now. Lucy touched on the self-employed, and that's really the focus of this uh, session. Um, so <laughs> I'm very pleased to invite uh, uh, Ryan uh, Barrett and uh, Philip Ross uh, to lead on this. They are both members of the Labour Business Executive Committee. Ryan, over to you. Uh, it's Ryan Barnett, Hamish. Hello, I'm I don't sorry, know. I'm sorry, I can't read this <laughs> tiny print. No problem. Um, so in my day job, I'm an economist at Ipsy, which is a trade body for the self-employed, and obviously Philip has uh, has passed the foundation there as well. And I'll pass on to Philip in a minute to go on to some of the, the minutiae of the, the schemes and things. Well, we've done a lot of research, and we have a lot of anecdotal evidence as well. We're speaking with other trade bodies. Now, there are 5 million people who are self-employed in the country at the moment. A lot of that growth over the last few years has been quite rapid. Most of it's been from women, often in care, sometimes lower pay, but also things, people in uh, who are supply teachers, uh, dentists, a lot of the growth has come from, from those jobs and a lot of those you know, places of work are now closed. And we're seeing that from both our survey evidence, but also anecdotally, that the lockdown in particular has had a massive impact on the self-employed, are probably at the sharpest end. You know, if you're looking at events, jobs, construction and the trades um, and particularly creative in, uh, industries as well mm -hmm. yeah. because a, a lot of people who say I don't know I know you're a Manchester MP but you know Corrie or EastEnders or whatever they'll often hire freelancers 
And most of those freelancers will probably be limited companies, which I'm sure Philip will come to in a minute. Um, and they obviously can't work, but we're hearing from them that in a lot of cases, their work is being cancelled, not for the next couple of months, but often much further down the line because often it can be prep work. And some of that work is being, even being cancelled in 2021. And along with the events and, you know, it's the summer we're moving into now, especially festival season, a lot of those people will be self-employed as well. So, you know, that's the kind of general picture. But in terms of the actual um, schemes, um, which has already been highlighted by everyone so far, pretty much, that there are sharp edges to both the self-employment scheme, which mainly applies to sole traders. But for those that are limited companies, they may have access to the furloughing scheme but a lot of them obviously don't. And there are 2 million limited companies in the country and about 700,000 of those are sort of one man band, self-employed people, freelancers, people that might be consultants or designers or you know, all sorts of people working in finance, but also people not earning so much are working in creative industries as well. And the, the edges of those schemes are very, very sharp uh, because they're based on the tax returns and they, that period is for 2018, 19, the cutoff. People have become self-employed most recently. The 50K cap is very sharp as well. And you know, if you've taken, say, uh, caring leave as a parent or for someone else in your family, that's much harder to, to factor into the government's calculations as well. So whilst, yes, the, I think the government schemes for those that are eligible are incredibly generous to those inside the tent. If you are outside the tent, you are often left behind. And that covers people like Liz and also uh, lots of other business owners. So if I, I'm going to pass on to the, my good man, uh, Philip, and he'll go into some more detail, I think. Yeah, well, there's a bit of a game of musical chairs where you were when the furlough got caught, when it got called. If you if you just started self-employed and then you were actually, then you suddenly found yourself outside it, even though you may have been a taxpayer for 20 years working permanently, suddenly you found yourself in that, in that wrong place. And what we have to remember is a lot of people who are working self-employed, it's a spread for 5 million people, but there's a huge chunk of precarious people who are working self-employed. And then you've also got, you've got more professionals than otherwise, but people have still got all same different liabilities wherever they are, which is why the 50 grand cutoff sounds, sounds, you know, that well, well off, but actually people have still got huge liabilities to actually get, get themselves through. There's the, the payment by, by, by dividends. And the issue people have got if they're self-employed now is uh, if you're working, oh, thank God, you know, you're actually, you're actually still working, probably taking rate cuts, which has gone across everywhere, which is, fa which is fair enough. But there's no real, there's not that much more work out there. So once you fall off the cliff, you're, 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 you're off. And that's the big concern that, um, that, pe that, people, that people have got. Um, and the big, biggest concern we've got in the whole of the self-employed industry, the self-employed was, you know, it's the furlough scheme was actually for employees, which is accepted. Everyone who's getting a pension is still getting their pension. People in the public sector are going to be paid. But for the self-employed, it was actually portrayed as if it was a big favour to the self-employed, actually, despite the fact that we all still pay our taxes and actually do stuff. So it's actually, and we all know that afterwards, actually, that we'll be paying higher taxes anyway to put it up. But why is it, it's, it didn't feel quite right that we, it, it was a favour to the, to the, to the self-employed for this to, to actually happen. A couple of positives that have come is just like all the self-employed people, the VAT deferral was actually a good thing because keeping money with business before taking it off them is actually has to be a good thing. If you weren't working, suddenly you've still got money in your pots. Uh, as a self-employed limited company contractors, the fact that they suspended the new IR35 stuff was actually good, was a positive thing as well because it's actually it's kept money in with people actually. And also it would have mixed up the whole issue of who was going to be caught and wasn't going to be caught anyway. Um, those are a couple of the big issues there. The, um, the other one is actually, uh, which I've mentioned uh, to, to people before, is around, and I think you picked up with it before, is about these the co-working community hubs, you know, that people, it's not all we work and Google actually, there's lots of co-op, um, cooperative based co-working mm -hmm. hubs, and you mentioned one Lucy in your thing. Now the problem they've got is they're not actually uh, eligible for the, uh, is it the extended retail and hospitality and leisure guard, but they've got nobody coming in through the doors. And it's not just people going and getting individual desks there. There's lots of small businesses who base themselves out of these, these hubs. And if we lose these hubs, we're going to lose a lot of that infrastructure for growth to actually go forward. And actually, I just, you know, just want to get to see the government get some common sense around this. Which, And I kind of get the feeling at the moment there's no party political points. It's actually all good ideas from every sector actually to take it, and which is, I imagine is why a lot of the Tory MPs listening to you, because they need as many good voices to actually 
take in take in the information that we that we want. But um, and I think I think that's those those are the key points that we've actually got. And, you know, and it's the fact that the new freelancers who aren't covered actually is the, is yeah. the you know is is a key one. Well, um, thank you, Ryan and um, Bill, for that really, um, really helpful um, and uh, I'm very, very sympathetic to these these issues. Um, and, you know, I, from day one was contacted by lots of uh, who did in that was around self-employed and the, the small sole trader limited company, because I've got a lot of musicians, a lot of people in the creative industries and so on in my own constituency who are exactly in that sort of situation. One suggestion I made on the self-employed, because a, a professor from Manchester University had sent me a paper on it, was for the newly self-employed, that um, why can't they be given like a point in May, the end of May now, to submit mm. their tax return for the financial year that's just gone? Because that's now complete, it's sort of the right time of year to do that, so that then they can be put into the scheme, even if, even if they wouldn't kind of get the money back until July or something, at least you'd know it was coming. So um, I don't know what you think about that, but I, I haven't sort of I haven't pushed Annalise and everyone else harder on that since I suggested it a couple of weeks ago. Um, but I think I don't know why why that wasn't sort of taken forward. But I think that's something we could be pushing. I think on this sole trader point, um, again, you get the sort of pushback about well, how do you sort of make sure you're excluding the lawyers or those people that are kind of uh, directors of a number of smaller company some of which they're you know that it's not their sole trade and uh, they just happen to sort of be part of lots of limited companies but I have seen proposals that I think you could get around that with with caps and uh, similar caps maybe that are across other schemes or um, types of businesses and, and that kind of thing I don't think that's beyond the realm and again you know when you think about who that is the sort of plumbers and electricians or you know in my sort of constituency the musicians and things this is this is Tory territory, really, isn't it? This is sort of white man van from Harlow, um, sort of coming into London every day to do some plumbing and uh, electrical work type thing. So I, I, you know, I think I think there would be a lot more sort of political consensus to, to some of that, um, but there seems a bit of reluctance on our side and on their side to push too hard on that. I don't really know why, but I'm extremely sympathetic to it personally, so I will continue to internally sort of push those things but if you do have sort of policy ideas about how some of those things might get resolved please you know e email them to me and um mm. and, and and we'll we'll keep push pushing away well i mean it seems be calling something very similar um you know why can't you just put in a tax return right now for that last year give them a month, an extra month but you know there are as you said as well there is this big weight um and a lot of people are turning to universal universal credit uh, that are self-employed and and having to wait for the money a lot longer than those that are employees through the furlough scheme is another big issue as well. And we're seeing, because obviously people, if they're self-employed, have to put a tax return in. They've got money set aside. And if, if they're waiting for the money or they're not, and if they therefore apply for universal credit, those savings can then hinder the amount of money you could get access to. And well, we have been told by the government that they, the government and uh, DWP, when they assess that, will set aside those savings Excellent. now. So Excellent. if you've got if you've got a few thousand pounds saved to pay a future tax bill, they won't be included in your universal credit. Um, we probably need to get that message out a bit a bit more widely. Mm. But yeah, I mean I know whatever, there's lots of challenges and I really, you know, I think what you were saying about the, the trepidation, the kind of the, the very insecure nature of a lot of self-employed um, work and how really in the economy that will be the probably the last bit of the economy in a way to, to sort of to pull back in so for that five million it's not just the challenges with this scheme which might only last for three or four months let's say you know five months most or something like that it's the two years after that isn't it yeah. um, where, where, they're, where they're likely to not not really have um, you know the same the same level of income if at all that's right and there's big opportunities for us actually who and we all believe we're the natural party of the self-employed and small business actually to have those policy things to actually put in place stuff to actually help make self-employment not so precarious going forward after this big wake up actually whether it's actually we can look at insurances schemes and things like that to actually help make it more sustainable and help people build some self-help stuff whether it's working with co-ops and others actually Definitely. 
Mm. And that's, that's a huge opportunity for us. I, def- I totally agree. And I think, you know, this is a bit of a wake up call on that, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, lots of people have been encouraged to do self-employment, encouraged to kind of set up their own businesses and all of that sort of stuff. But then they just don't have the safety net that that, that employees do uh, in these in these moments. So we, we are going to have to look at that for the, for the future, definitely. I'm going to have to uh, wrap up this segment okay. now. Thanks very much to uh, Ryan and Philip. And on that last note, I think it's just a, a, a call to arms for all of us in labor business that we've got a, an electoral cycle in which we need to build on the policies that we've been talking about. And it's a slogan we use a lot, but I'll use it again, making labor the natural party of business, small businesses, medium and large sized businesses, so that we can show that we've got the answers to uh, the, the trick of sustainable economic growth. Uh, and that's why, actually, I said to Ed when I spoke to him, you know, the green agenda, which we haven't really focused on today, that's so exciting that we can do things to start talking about a sustainable uh, economy. But uh, forgive me, I'll, I'll move on now uh, to the last uh, segment. Uh, we're going to hear from John Lehal, who's a member of our executive committee on a range of other issues, including insurance, uh, late payment and rent. So, John, can you take that one on? Yeah, for yeah I'll tear straight in, uh, Lucy. Three things I'm gonna talk about here. Um, first is around business interruption insurance. There's been a bit of media pickup on this. Uh, now, obviously companies take out business interruption insurance against uh, things like the forced shutdown of their business. And it's quite a specialist product, so not every insurer provides it, but there are some market leaders, Hiscox particularly, RSA Group is another one. And typically the payout is up to about 100,000 pounds in terms of the claim. Uh, Hiscox have estimated there's 10,000 of their customers whose businesses have been impacted by the lockdown. And uh, uh, it's fair to say they're being a bit slippery. Um, Now, I've looked at the standard policy wording. I won't go into it here, but maybe I'll follow up. Uh, We could follow up with you afterwards. Um, But to the layperson, it looks pretty obvious that, you know, the closure of this type because of the government's lockdown uh, would qualify. But Hiscox have already put out a market update saying that... um, you know, don't worry shareholders, uh, you know, we don't need to pay out on this basis. And clearly people who've taken out the insurance policies in good faith are now kind of thinking, hang on a minute. Um, they're starting to get organized. So there's a couple of action groups that have been set up. Um, and the risk is that, you know, even if they do t- try to just defer it, it will go to the um, financial ombudsman service. And that, you know, once something goes there, it's yeah, months, yeah. years and, you know, the business know, yeah. So we really feel that there's a case to put pressure on those insurance companies in particular. Um, one of our members, Nigel Watson, who's another publican from the Anchor in Worthing, uh, will join the chat hopefully and add anything that he can. Yeah, I'm, I'm just a, a micro pub, so I'm a very small pub as opposed to Liz and obviously got quite a larger place by the look of it. Um, but the business interruption scheme, uh, not business interruption insurance, to the layman, i.e. me, it looks pretty much cut and dry that I've been shut down by the business, not uh, by the government, not through any fault of my own. And they're, um, the, the insurance companies are just refusing to pay out. I've taken steps thus far individually before I realised that there were some group actions going on. To uh, um, I've got my, an independent assessor is now writing to the, my insurance company um, on my behalf. Um, and apparently he's doing it for some other people as well, but because of the data protection, he's like, he can't exactly tell me who he's, who's doing it for. Um, but it just strikes me that, that it's a get out clause for the insurance company who seems to be looking after the shareholder rather than the policy holder. Um, and it's, it's bloody annoying to be quite honest. Um, it's, it's uh, came as quite a shock, you know, business interruption, I've been interrupted. If I'd come back from Africa or abroad with a disease, infected some customers, fair enough, I could be shut down, you know, and I wouldn't expect to get uh, uh, any business, ins- you know, uh, interruption insurance. That is, there's quite a clear exclusion for that. But the exclusion d- isn't clear enough, in my opinion, and it's certainly to the, the average person who reads an insurance policy, oh, right, well, yeah, I'll get shut down, yeah, I'll be covered. This is, a, this is a national shutdown and the insurance companies are going to have to take a hit in, I think, Lucy. Um, I don't know what your opinion is on it. 
Yeah, well, I completely, um, I'm very, very sympathetic to it um, as I as I was. Sorry, I'm just turning something <clears> on my computer. As I was before, um, you know, in that phase. I, I mean, I was contacted by well, hundreds of, of. I've got lots of micro breweries in my constituency as well, um, and micro pubs and things. So, I mean, but I was contacted in that week. Do you remember when the prime minister said? We all remember it well. But the prime minister said, "Don't go to the pub." And the restaurant before it was the official sort of lockdown yeah. and obviously at that point everyone was saying well, if you don't tell us officially to close you can't claim it on the insurance yeah. um and then but then it turns out of course when the lockdown was then actually done most people couldn't claim it either so i mean i think it's an outrage really that's exactly what insurance is for i mean i can understand that from an insurance uh, sort of point of view um they probably never kind of really Put that into their modelling, particularly that, that, that the vast majority of their um, in business holders would 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 claim it all at one in one go. Um, but then, you know, I think rather than being tricksy about that, we just need to sort of find a way through that. I mean, there's a similar situation in relation to um, it, it, it's similar-ish, I suppose, in relation to travel companies. Um, with the ABTA scheme and the ATOL scheme and all of that sort of thing where, you know, they're not offering refunds to their, because because they can't, if they everybody got a refund at the same time, most of the businesses would, would collapse, but then will the insurance companies actually pay out the customers to that and things like that? So that, I think the government needs to be more proactive in, in arbitrating these situations actually and giving clearer guidance as well, rather than let me think the last thing everyone wants is that to go to an ombudsman. I mean, that would be that would take years and years. By which point, most people would have gone out of business anyway. Yeah, great. Uh, so we can we'll pick up on that with you. Um, yeah, after. definitely. The other one was around um, rents as well. So obviously, the government legislation that was introduced um, stopped landlords from issuing any form of statutory demands or winding up orders on businesses, and that runs to the end of June. Uh, and anyone who's run a business knows that end of March, end of June, end of September, end of December is when your quarterly rent is due. So it's not long before those are due and it's gonna be one of the first things that people face them when they're back uh, in, in June. Uh, you probably would have seen that Jeremy Joseph from GAY Club, which probably uh, I guess is in your constituents as well as London, has gone back to his landlords to say, look, you know, can we come to an agreement? And it's a, it's a flat no from those guys. Um, so certainly we have to, extend we feel that there's a case to extend that deadline from the end of june uh, to stop uh, landlords um but also again i think it's kind of you know, what the expectation is you know um i think the groveners and the telereels and those guys probably have a broader shoulders to, to weather this than some of the uh, smes who are their tenants and uh, again so i think there's a case there to really work specifically on private sector companies there that are that are, that, that, that you know for, that, that will determine what the future looks like for a lot of SMEs. No, I, I completely agree. Um, and I mean, I think in the media, even in the medium term of their business model, surely it's in their interest because it, it's better to maintain the businesses that they've got in the premises that they've got rather than the alternative, which is going to be, let's be honest, if, 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 if business is going to the wall at this point, you know, it's going to be a number of years of vacancy um, mm. that they're going to have to, going to have to support. So, I think you know. I think there's a there's a business case there for for those guys too. I don't know if you saw. I was um, talking to Ed Miliband about that this week. But um, Justin Trudeau in Canada has has come to a, a as, as issued like a, a rent furlough scheme essentially. So the Canadian government are paying seventy five percent of small business rent for the next few months. So. You know, I think we, we're going to have to move in this sort of space, whether it's through the cash grant scheme and extending that to higher rateable values and to the micro businesses that currently can't get it and so on, um, and extending it further once lockdown itself is extended, um, or whether it's looking at a rent scheme, because it's the other big fi fixed cost, isn't it? So if, you, if your business is closed for four, five, up to nine months or, or whatever, or as Liz was saying, the business then even when you go back, you're only operating at half, half your usual capacity or something, um, then, then more support is needed. Otherwise, businesses are going to go to, to, to the wire. Mm. Hold. Yep, agree. And the final one is the perennial problem of late payment. Um, and mm. I think it was raised at the, at the Biz Select Committee uh, meeting this morning. But 
obviously an opportunity for the public sector or anything or, or NHS others to make sure they're shortening their payment terms to SMEs and freelancers or even recategorizing how they classify those SMEs and freelancers. And the Small Business Commissioner should really name and shame companies that aren't paying. And I mean, it lacks teeth. I mean, we've, we as a party, we've been talking about this and as an organisation talked about this a lot. But it not only does it lack teeth, but it doesn't make any effort to actually go out and talk about best practice and then name and shame people. And I think there's a, a real need to get money out to some very vulnerable businesses. And there's no point in it sitting on the balance sheets of larger companies and, the, and government bodies. It needs to get out. Yeah, I totally agree. And, the, you know, the government needs to lead by example, doesn't it, in public mm -hmm. sector, who are often quite rubbish as well um, at, at, at these kind of things. So, yeah, I mean, happy to, to work with you you on a campaign on those sorts of things and to, to press those issues, definitely. Great. So, uh, thank you, John. I think we're getting close to the witching hour. I'd like to give uh, Lucy an opportunity to make some closing remarks. Can I just uh, throw in a question to you, Lucy? Um, as you do that. Um, we're joined today, I'm glad to say, by Ibrahim Dogas, who's the chair of uh, SME for Labour. We work closely together. And he's asked me to put his question because he's surrounded by kids who are making a lot of noise. So I'm happy to do that. So uh, there are a number of questions, uh, but the key one, I think, is uh, how do we make the case, which I referred to earlier, for Labour as the, the natural party of business? What are the key messages you think that we need to get out to the business community and the wider electorate? Well, yeah, good question. Good question to finish on. And hi, Ibrahim, as well. Um, I think I'm speaking to um, SME for Business tomorrow, I think, from memory. Um, so I look forward to, to that chat. Um, well, look, I mean, it's perhaps not been the best era in our sort of some of our relationships with, um, with business um, more recently. But I, I think this whole um, situation that we're now in is is going to fundamentally um, and I mean I hope well potentially sort of permanently sort of change the relationship between business and, and the state actually because what what we've seen isn't it that, that at times like this actually you know the state needs to come in and support uh, business so there is a more proactive sort of political role in um, in enterprise and in business, and I think, I think for labour, what we can do is is do two things. One is be that voice for business right now, um, with the shortcomings in the support that that businesses need, um, and you know I hope we can continue to do that in a sort of strong but constructive sort of way, but in a in a clear and strong way that shows that you know that we we get it. And then I think moving out of, out of that um, you know era is 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 kind of re-establishing that relationship, I suppose, between um, politics, policy, the state, and and the business community, and and you know both sides recognizing that that's a sort of partnership um, that we that we need to foster, and I think that potentially sort of provides a an opportunity for for Labour to shape that narrative. Uh, about that because you know we, you, everybody needs that safety net that's what and that's what the Labour Party's sort of values are, are based on and that what we found over the last few weeks is that you know that you know even out of nowhere you can suddenly yourself rely on those safety nets whether it's a furlough scheme a loan scheme a grant scheme or universal credit or you know or the health service sort of personally so perhaps we can we can we can shape that that sort of future a bit more together, but we're very keen, um, myself, Ed Miliband, Keir, Annalise, the whole team, to have that very close relationship with business and try and be the voice um, for, for business uh, in, in the political context. That's great. Thank you, Lucy. Um, can I just uh, say a couple of things? One, to thank everybody, but apologize for the fact we haven't been able to take all the questions and comments, but I'm assured that we can get them in writing to Lucy's office, so your comments and questions won't be missed. We'll do that. Oh, and maybe let's call. do maybe let's do this again. You know, in in, a, that, in, a, in, a, in, a, point, in a couple Lucy. of weeks. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. My second point was that we need to do this regularly, and I'm conscious that the agenda today was what are we doing with the lockdown crisis. We need to have a discussion pretty soon, as Keir said, about the exit strategy. How exactly. do we release the country and the economy from lockdown? So I'm very keen that we do another session around that because we haven't had time for it today.